I have been uh, given this a part of this presentation at, at a number of conferences and university lectures to engineers, but I realize I've never presented it to this group in a way that you could uh, question it, uh, critique it, and you know ask questions about it because I want everybody on our team to really understand where this model came from. And uh, it's amazingly accurate, which uh, I couldn't think would be possible compared to much, much more complicated models. But I think always at NASA, if we could get a simple model to explain it, I mean, that was the one we wanted. That's generally true in all of science. If you could write a doctoral dissertation on one page, I mean, you're a Nobel Prize winner. So I'm not embarrassed about the simplicity of this model. It's rigorous and it works. So I thought I'd start and um, show this chart. This is the global mean surface temperature of the Earth. This is the oldest uh, record of it. It's maintained by the uh, Hadley Climate Research Unit in East Anglia, UK. This is the same group that had the climate gate scandal. But their data goes back to 1850, and I wanted the longest record we could get. Um, so what, what you're looking for is a model that is rigorous and explains this data. Um, and we've been playing with this since, I think, June of 2013 was the first time we started trying to model why this data behaved the way it did. Al, it doesn't really matter, but what is their basis for the zero, the mean? The okay, deviation? good question. This is not the approximate value of the global mean surface temperature that give an absolute Kelvin, and it's 288 degrees Kelvin. 288 degrees Celsius above absolute zero. So they, they don't want to imply that their data is the actual global mean. So they pick an average of, of this database, it's usually around you know, 1960 to 1990, and then they, they look at deviations from that. So back in 1850, uh, the temperatures were running 0.2 to 0.4 degrees uh, Celsius below the average of some period of between 1960 and 1990. And so they call this an anomaly, which is kind of strange to aerospace guys. Anomalies to us are something's gone wrong and they got to fix it. But in climate science, the anomaly just means it's the, it's the variation up and down from some base period. So what's happened in, that's important here is uh, if we take the top of the range, minus 0.2, and now we're up to about plus 0.6, so that's a, that's a change of 8 tenths of a degree centigrade over 165 years, and this has caused a big global alarm. But, not going to go through it today, but we look back, well, what was, what was the temperature doing before 1850? We look back, well, we look back hundred thousands of years, and there weren't thermometers, weren't many around. There were thermometers maybe in the early 1700s, but we had ice cores, and we learned what the global temperatures were doing from ice cores that went back, in some cases, millions of years. 700,000 years in Antarctica. But this is what all the concern is about. What's happened here, and, and I can tell you that what's happened in this time is well within the variations of the last 10,000 years when carbon dioxide was constant. So, you know, we immediately say, well, this looks like deviations in the normal range. But at the same time this temperature's going up, 
we've got carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere going up. And so f this goes back to 1750. It was really flat for a long time. And then the industrial age was getting started in this time period, and it gradually rose. And then after World War II, it really started to zoom up. And we're right about here. This is about 2012 when I made this chart. This data is from ice cores. The blue is from measurements of carbon dioxide in Hawaii on uh, Mauna Loa Mountain, the NOAA Observatory there. And, you know, when you look at a map, Hawaii is kind of out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's kind of isolated. So they think a, a measurement of CO2 there is a good indicator of what it is all over the world. Because CO2, when you emit it from a smokestack, it immediately disperses laterally and vertically in a constant concentration by volume throughout the atmosphere. And then we did some projections of what, what it's going to do. And I, I hand drew this curve. I, I don't want too many people to know how I did it. But I had an endpoint that Dr. Stegemeyer gave me. He said, if we burned all the fossil fuel reserves on the planet, everything that's known and records are kept by the U.S. government Energy Information Agency, we could get 600 parts per million. So I figured, well, we're going to continue to grow. At some point, I've got to hit 600, and we're going to have to bend over, in, meaning that we're going to have to stop using fossil fuels and replace them with something else to meet the energy demand because we're using up our reserves here. So I just kind of drew this curve over and to a, a maximum point of about 2130. This is my guess at it. But then later, after we made this curve, we looked at projections by ExxonMobil and BP about what their projections for uh, their market for fossil fuels in like 2040 and it hit right on our number. If we looked at what they said they're going to market and sell for fossil fuels in the year 2040, and we convert that to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it fell on this curve. So I think it's a fairly middle of the road. But it assumes that to meet energy demand, we've got to find something else besides fossil fuels. So I, Dr. Stegemeyer, the first time we met at those seminars, I met him and he said, look, I've been looking at this. I'm worried, to, where are we going to get the fossil fuels from? He said, I'm not worried about global warming. He said, we're going to run out. And he did a lot of work on that to convince me that if you use the official data, we're going to run out. So this is the way the climate science community is modeling this problem. And this is a famous curve. All of us that have been studying this know it. This curve was presented to the U.S. House of Representatives by Dr. John Christie, who's the state climatologist in Alabama and has spoken to our group in this room. Um, but the last big United Nations report had a bunch of models that they were studying. And they ran simulations using the actual measured greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And we had data up till about here. And they're running the actual data. And they're getting temperatures that just totally diverge from what we're actually measuring with satellites and weather balloons. And these are temperatures in, say, around 15,000 feet in the tropics. And Christie wanted to check how well those models were predicting the hot spot in the atmosphere that the global warming theorists say is, is the big signal of the greenhouse gases. They don't, I mean, this is terrible correlation. The models don't agree with each other, and they don't agree with the data. To us, this is useless. And um, 
we just would ignore such models for any serious use. But this is what they're proud of. So we tried to decide, can we do better models? I have to review a few definitions for those of you that haven't been studying this for five years like we have. The big holy grail of climate science is called equilibrium climate sensitivity. And what that means is all the scientists are trying to figure out if we double CO2 in the atmosphere, how much would the Earth's surface warm when we reached equilibrium? And this means we pump a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere and then the atmosphere and the oceans are going to interact and after some period of time we're off of this transient and we're back to some equilibrium state. The problem is this, this equilibrium state is more than a thousand years in the future. And there's a lot of speculation about what goes on between now and a thousand years from now. But this is what they try to, try to determine, equilibrium climate sensitivity. Generally, they compute it by complex, unvalidated computer model simulations like you saw on the previous slide, which aren't any good. And then there's some other funny things they do to try to simulate this. This is a totally unrealistic scenario, but it's the most popular with, with academics in the climate community. And they're all comparing their values for ECS, and they're all over the map. And they're trying to tell our politicians to make decisions on this stuff. I didn't think we could do better than these big models, I, but, but I think you'll see that we did. The other metric they use is something called transient climate response and it's a similar metric of how much warm how much would we warm the surface of the earth if we double co2 in the atmosphere but let's do it more like it's really happening where we have a slow growth in atmospheric co2 their their slow growth is increase CO2 concentration by 1% per year until it doubles. So if you run that out mathematically, it's like a geometric progression, it takes 70 years to double the initial value if you increase it by 1% per year. Um, up until you know the last decade, it, the, the rate of increase is it's only about half a percent per year. So this hypothetical thing that they look at and try to calculate is about twice what's been happening recently. I looked in preparation for today, what, how much did CO2 increase from 2015 to 2016? And it was a jump that was closer to 1%, but it's very erratic, so you kind of have to average it over 10 years. So. It, it's in the it's in the order of two to two and a half parts per million per year. Question? Is it the Mauna Loa measure, measurement of CO2 that you're Yeah, measuring? there are other places it's measured, but Mauna Loa is a good average. And Mauna Loa, during the year, it's seasonal because of the effect that plants have on it. And <coughs> so and the ocean. peak to peak, you could you could vary by seven parts per million during the year. We didn't like either of these metrics that billions of research dollars are chasing. One reason is, how would you, how would you ever get data to measure it? If this, is, this is hypothetical. This isn't what happens, so how would you ever measure that with physical data? The only way you can do it is to have a climate model and simulate it. Everything in climate science, when you start looking about it, is gathered around these big complicated models that don't get the right answer. The whole, the whole group, to me, doesn't follow the scientific method. They're, they'd rather look at their model output than physical data. And I'm very critical of them. So we came up with a different metric. And I think our state climatologist helped us 
name it, transient climate sensitivity. We wanted something that you could actually verify with data, not necessarily a model. So we could define it like this. It's the rise in global average surface temperature due to the actual gradual rise of CO2 in our atmosphere until CO2 levels are doubled. We can measure that. We're measuring CO2, we know when it's gonna double, and we can look at the temperature and see how much it increased in that period of time. So with physical data, we can determine what that number is. Now, looking at it analytically, the effects of all the greenhouse gases, which include CO2 is an important one, but uh, there are other, uh, methane is important. Um, I think sulfur dioxide is the other, and there's the nitrous one. But the total effects, the warming effects, are about one and a half times the CO2 only effect. And then we'll revisit that. But if you're going to have CO2 regulations, you need to know if I just control CO2, how much would I affect the problem? So we now have a verifiable quantity, and we're going to use that as our metric. EPA uses this ECS for regulatory decisions. Uh, this is just a lot of criticism of what they do. Um, we've written reports on this. We validated a model. We developed it and validated it. Our model is derived from conservation of energy principles. The, the actual quantity we're working with is power, which is the rate of energy flow. It's not just energy, but it's the rate of energy flow. And we have a situation where we've had more now than a 40% rise in atmospheric CO2 since 1850. We, I showed you that approximately eight tenths Kelvin, or we could also use centigrade here, rise in global average surface temperature since 1850. So we have this constant that we're going to show you how we derived. This is our transient climate sensitivity. This is the effect of doubling CO2. But the total warming is CO2 plus some contribution of the other greenhouse gases. But we know that is 1.8 Kelvin because that's what the temperature change says it is. This beta is the fraction of CO2 radiative forcing caused by other greenhouse gases and aerosols. So we're just saying the total warming is the effect of CO2 plus the effect of all the other greenhouse gases. This is uh, putting things in perspective. We started with CO2 down here around 280 parts per million. And when it doubles, it's going to be up here around 570. And it's taken 160 some years to do that. That's what everybody's worried about. But the point is the plant growth requirement is 150 parts per million. And just on this scale, where we were was dangerously close to the 150 parts per million where all plants will die on this planet. That would have been a climate disaster. And we actually got down to about 180 parts per million at the time of the last uh, glacial maximum. So this is what's going on. This is what we allow on the space station, 5,000 parts per million. Navy submarines that are under the sea, under the surface for six months at a time or more, they allow 8,000. OSHA allows 10,000 parts per minute for limited exposure. So this climate thing that's been postulated as some kind of CO2 problem in the atmosphere doesn't come close to these well understood issues where CO2 in the atmosphere doesn't bother humans or animals. And I just like to put that in perspective because you hear all this concern about CO2 and on this basis it doesn't look like anything's going on. Plus we know from the geologists in our group, Leighton's written a book on this, in the history of the Earth, we had up to 7,000 parts per million in our atmosphere. 
And the natural tendency of the earth is to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. The green plants do it, the oceans do it. Um, and that's how we got from 7,000 parts per million down to 180 at the last glacial maximum. So whatever we're doing here, I'm confident it's beneficial. It's getting us away from this really hazardous boundary. And so you've seen our CO2 projection. This just shows at 2100, which is an important milestone, the end of the century, we're projecting that we're gonna have 585 parts per million in the atmosphere. We're at about 400 right now, we're right in here. And you know, this is based on how many, what the proven reserves are worldwide and uh, the rate at which we're gonna use them up. So this is the way climate scientists look at this problem. I've uh, borrowed this chart from some of the most alarming scientists in the climate science world. We're very prominent, Trenberth, Kevin Trenberth, who's one of those guys. And all of the climate people generally agree on this number. What happens is we've got a certain amount of energy coming from the sun and it gets reflected by the atmosphere and clouds out to deep space and CO2 never gets to operate on it. The rest of it gets down to the surface. The surface reflects some of it. And then we've got 161 watts, just like your 100 watt light bulb in your house. Watts is a unit of uh, energy per second, energy used per second and per every meter squared of the Earth's surface. So that is absorbed and heats up the surface. And then some of that heat gets transferred out to the upper atmosphere by thermals, like you see in thunderstorms. A big part of it, 80 watts per meter squared, is transferred from the surface to higher, colder atmosphere by the evaporation of water from our oceans and condensation of water vapor at higher altitudes. So all of this heat here is being transported away from the surface, but we need more heat transported. So this is infrared radiation whose rate is determined by the temperature of the surface, and it joins with the atmosphere that's radiating and it, when we get to the top of the atmosphere, we have 239 watts per meter squared going out to deep space. This is the way the Earth cools itself, very much like our body cools itself by sweating, evaporating, cooling, and carrying that heat away from our bodies. This radiation is carrying heat. So what happens if we don't carry enough heat away, the Earth's surface warms up, but once it warms up, it radiates at a higher rate. That's how it, it controls temperature. Now, notice how they drew this curve. Here's the Earth. Here's all that's going on in the atmosphere. Their big climate models try to simulate all of this going on with increases in greenhouse gases. And they've got to simulate all these processes in the atmosphere and all of the exchanges with the oceans and simulate that for a thousand years or more to figure out how much the earth is going to warm if you double the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So now I'm going to show you the way I think engineers would, this, this is the next thing I'm going to show you is how do engineers know when we put a spacecraft in orbit and we put humans in there, how do we get confidence that they're not going to burn up? How do we co get confidence when they do an EVA and they touch the surface of the spacecraft, it's not going to be too hot? We have to do analyses to predict those temperatures and verify those analyses. And we've been putting people in space since 1961, and we know how to do this. And this is the way we'd make a simple model of it. Remember, that's what, that's what technology's doing. They're not coming close to the data. But here's putting things in perspective. If this is a thousand mile arc of the Earth's surface, this other line, that's the top 
of the atmosphere that actually affects radiation going out to deep space. It's not all of the atmosphere, but it's about 99% of it is at the top of the stratosphere, which is about 22 kilometers or 14 miles up. So I've drawn this to scale. So back here, where the climate scientists are working on this, they view the atmosphere as this big thing they got to deal with. We deal with the atmosphere as, man, it's a really thin covering over the Earth's surface. And we know, the climate scientists all agree, this is what's coming in from the sun, this is what's being reflected back out and not even affecting the temperature of the Earth's surface, other than the fact that we're rejecting all this heat to deep space. Some of this heat at the surface goes into the oceans. It's a small amount compared to these other. And then this part is radiated. We, we can measure that. They showed it as 239 rounded off on the previous chart. But this is the formula that we calculate radiant radiated heat from a body and this is a universal constant this is absolute temperature to the fourth power and this is something we call emissivity that basically is a correction factor for we might calculate 500 here but the value of emissivity knocks it back down to the measured value so in spacecraft we actually measure this and test we don't try to compute it the way the climate scientists did so we can, we can create a simple energy balance because the energy has to be conserved. So the energy in minus part reflected out minus the part that goes into the oceans, has to, the remainder has to be radiated away in a balance of temperature at equilibrium. And we can model that very simply. So this is the equation. This is the emissivity. This is the infrared radiation going to deep space from the surface of the Earth. And this is the incoming energy from the sun minus what's reflected by the albedo, which is like the reflectivity of the Earth. And this is the part going into the deep ocean. Now there's some other radiation we have to consider, and Dr. Stegemeyer did all the calculations. In general, we need to think about incoming radiation from stars other than our sun. Uh, we need to think about the heat rising from the Earth's molten core to the surface. What we're trying to do is get a heat balance at the surface. So what other heat sources do we have to consider other than these biggies? And then there's heat generation processes on the Earth's surface, forest fires, uh, decaying organic matter, uh, burning fossil fuels. But when you actually evaluate these kind of things, they're negligible compared to like this number, which is small. So we've been thorough in thinking about what, what all is affecting Earth's surface temperature. These things are negligible, but usually nobody ever talks about. I used to wonder about, what about this molten core of the Earth? How do we handle that? but it is a small number. So developing this a little bit further, I'm just explaining these terms here on this chart. This is our same equation. Now I'm gonna apply some calculus just to be sure I collect all the right terms. So what I'm looking at is a differential, which means a change in this term has to be balanced by a change in this term. And so those of us that have had differential calculus know how to do this operation. And mathematically, to get this a change, we take partial derivatives of the emissivity with respect to water vapor and the partial derivative of water vapor with respect to carbon concentration in the atmosphere, and that takes care of this term. Then there's a partial of the emissivity with respect to carbon dioxide directly, which is that term, times a change in carbon dioxide. Plus, similar thing for the change in concentrations of other greenhouse gases. And then we get this term, which comes from uh, taking a derivative of this, so we get 4 times E times sigma T to the cubed dt. So we're looking at changes in 
CO2 concentration, changes in other greenhouse gases, and changes in temperature have to be balanced by changes on this side. So this is just taking the derivatives of, of this term. We get 1 minus A times DS minus S times DA minus DQ. I mean, that's just turning the crank on the mathematics. The question is, what does all these terms mean? Well, I've never seen anybody compute this constant before. We knew that the change in temperature was about 0.3 times the changes in the uh, effects of greenhouse gases. But actually, we can derive this term from performing the calculus on that. I've never seen this talked about in any climate science publications. In fact, my original work on this in the boundary report, I used an empirical estimate of that number. I was quite surprised when it, you know, it falls out of the uh, calculus manipulations. You have to know what the emissivity of the Earth is. Well, we can determine the emissivity of the Earth because we know this is a universal constant. We know because we measure this quantity that E sigma t to the fourth is about 239 watts per meter squared. That's been measured by satellites. We know the surface temperature of the Earth because we got thermometers averaging it. It's about 288 degrees Kelvin. So emissivity, from the emissivity equation, we can start here, just solve for emissivity. It's this 238 and a half divided by sigma t to the fourth. We know the emissivity average of the Earth's surface is 0.611. So we can evaluate this equation by solving on the left side for dt and bringing all this stuff over. So we find that dt is 1 over this constant, which is 1 over 0 0.302, but when we bring it to this side, it's 0 0.302 times this other stuff. And this other stuff we bring from this side changes an emissivity that's a function of water vapor carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. That's what these mathematical symbols mean, is changes in the emissivity due to changes in these variables, plus these other changes. And the temperature change has to be equal to all of these other changes that can happen. This thing right here, the climate scientists call radiative forcing from greenhouse gases. That's what they mean. Now, I don't think they've ever thought about it in terms of their changing emissivity of the Earth's surface. But that's the way engineers would look at it. This is analogous to, to control surfaces of temperatures on spacecraft. We paint them different colors. Some colors will absorb more heat and heat up the aluminum structure below it. Others will reflect it. And because we know from all the orbital characteristics the sun hitting it, um, which surfaces are going to heat up more than others, we coat those surfaces with a paint to control what temperature they end up at. Well, that paint that we put on the surface of a spacecraft is like the atmosphere covering the Earth. And we know if we change the color of the paint, we'll change the emissivity of the surface. So I have taken all of this complex climate model, BS, and made a constant out of it, emissivity, that we can measure. We don't have to calculate it with computational fluid dynamics. I mean, it just shows the futility of what they're trying to do. Let me go back and make this point. Thinking about all that they have to simulate, what's going to happen generally if they double CO2 in the atmosphere? It's going to change the emissivity that's going to reduce the infrared radiation to deep space by 4 watts per meter squared. They're trying to find that 4 watts per meter squared in all of this complex stuff that's going on. But that means they have to simulate 80 watts per meter squared and how it changes over a thousand years with, they'd have to simulate that with 2.5% accuracy to get 2 watts per meter squared.
And two watts per meter squared is 50% of the signal they're looking for in doubling CO2. It's an impossible problem. They're never going to solve this problem based on my experience with complex models. I never had a model that I was confident was within two and a half percent accuracy. When I sent my report in to the Trump transition team, I made this point is I think most of you would agree with they're never going to solve the problem the way they're trying to do it. Because of this issue, you've got to simulate that for thousands of years with two and a half percent accuracy to find the four watt or to find two watts per meter change here. It ain't going to happen. They need some adult supervision. <laughs> We had adult supervision. I mean, I came green out of college here. And we had people that kind of point you in the right direction and check you once in a while. But nobody is supervising the climate scientists. Nobody in our government that's handing out the research grants are thinking about this kind of stuff. And they're spending billions on these models. And in 30, what, seven years, they haven't they haven't made any progress at all. So I suggest it's time to change. And Mr. Trump agrees with me. And we're going to have a chance to affect what happens here in this new administration. So I don't, I'm sure I'm way over on time. But OK, so let me get on here to a few more points about the derivation. So I think we stopped here. So I've got to do some more evaluation of these terms. But um, so the radiative forcing changes from rising atmospheric CO2 concentration, this mathematical term that came out of our calculus manipulations can be represented this way. And this is not controversial. This is what climate scientists would agree with. This is what you can find in their old reports, like the AR4 report. Nobody's going to disagree. They might disagree about the value. They think this constant is maybe 3.4 to 3.9. It really doesn't matter, as we'll find out. So this term that we derived is evaluated this way. And it just says when this value is twice this one, we've got log 2 over log 2, that's 1. And the radiative force for doubling CO2 in the atmosphere is 3.71 watts per meter square. Is that the four you quoted a while ago? The four watts per meter? That's close to the four watts I was talking about. Yeah. And that's what we in the beginning of this group call the direct effect of doubling CO2. This is how you can compute this from looking at the uh, absorption lines of CO2 for infrared energy. Um, but then the climate models, that they take that 3.71, which is a kind of a warming. Uh, it's about 1.1 or 1 .1 degree. And then they assume a lot of feedbacks from that warming that multiply this thing. But when we measure it, we know that's not happening. So. There's another term that we have to evaluate. This is the change in emissivity with respect to the other greenhouse gases. And simple, but I'm saying, OK, we don't know exactly what it is, but it's some fraction beta of the radiative forcing of CO2. So we just put beta in front of this term and say, we don't know exactly what beta is, but this term can be written this way. And this just says, we got the CO2 radiative forcing. Here's the other greenhouse gas radiative forcing. Also, it includes the effects of aerosols, which tend to have a cooling effect. Some of these other greenhouse gases are warming. Aerosols, which are very tiny microscopic particles in the atmosphere, um, it's very uncertain what they do. They have some warming tendencies, some cooling, but generally, the climate scientists think they have cooling. And one thing they've been doing, trying to make their models agree, if, if the had crut four data went down in one year and their CO2 said it should have gone up, 
what they'll do is inject some aerosols into the atmosphere to cool it off and make their results look like the data. But there was no data that says there were extra aerosols that year. They just assumed it to make the results look good. We used to call that cooking the books or dry labbing it. I mean, there's all kind of NASA buzzwords, but that's a no-no. And if you get caught, you get your hand slapped or maybe you get fired. So we can talk about feedbacks. And one of the feedbacks, it's a big one they talk about, if you warm up the atmosphere, it's going to hold more water vapor. Water vapor is a big greenhouse gas, so you're going to get warming from that. And that's one of their big multiplier feedbacks of the initial warming from uh, blocking infrared ray leaving. So, but we can model that. We said, okay, here's the warming from CO2 and other greenhouse gases, and we'll get some more warming which is a constant W, the feedback constant for water vapor, times this function that we've already talked about. And here's where I'm not real happy with this derivation, but we said, well, maybe there's some other feedbacks. We don't even know what they are. But if they're feedbacks, then it's some constant F times the warming caused by CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So let's throw that in. I didn't have F on this side of the equation originally. I just threw it in here. And somebody may critique me on that. But I could go back to this equation and put F in here somewhere in a more rigorous way. But I just, after it got to this point, we saw how we were doing it. I said, well, let's, let's throw some other feedbacks. So now we factor this out. And we got this term, 1 plus W plus F. These are feedbacks, water vapor, other feedbacks. This is the CO2 concentration. This is the other greenhouse gases and aerosols. And, you know, we're just filling in our equation here that we derived with terms that can be evaluated. But then we have this cool way that we define transient climate sensitivity. I'm just repeating that equation from before and explaining here with this term, something we've talked about before. But here's the cool part. Using our definition for transient climate sensitivity as the temperature rise, including all feedbacks from doubling atmospheric CO2. This is our definition of transient climate sensitivity. Here's the 3.71 radiative forcing from doubling CO2 plus the feedbacks W and F. And of course, TCS only talks about CO2. It doesn't talk about the other greenhouse gases because that's the way climate scientists, they want to focus on TLC. Here's radiative forcing. 0.3 is that constant we derived in the calculus. And 0.3 times this is a temperature. So the part of the warming that we call transient climate sensitivity, which is really a CO2 term, is the CO2 part the feedbacks uh, times the radiative forcing of doubling CO2. And when we pull that out of our equation up here, our equation becomes TCS times the one plus beta that deals with other greenhouse gases times this radiative forcing term, which changes every year as the concentration of CO2 changes. And we still have this other part over here. But from the way we derived it, all of this expression is the warming we get from greenhouse gas concentrations rising in the atmosphere. In the data that we see, there's some other wiggles in the data, and that has to come from this part here, because these concentrations are steadily rising. And if we're going to get wiggles in temperature, it's got to come from changes in the albedo, uh, things changing with the sun, or changes in the heat that's going into the deep ocean. So that's where the spotted snakes curves came from, Jim, is from this part. So we kind of separated this problem now, and, and so I got a question from Neil Skid, well, what is the TRCS climate model? Because we started out with this part plus the wiggly part, and what I'm trying to do is just focus on the greenhouse gas part and found a way to ignore this part because it falls below the curve that we define by this part of our equation. Are there any questions at this point? I know 
It's just going fast. I had to review my calculus too. So what we have is an equation that we need to figure out how is it going to explain these data that are best data over the long haul. So here's the long-term trend, but there's some other wiggles going on. I'm saying the long-term trend is the most of what the greenhouse gases could do. And the other part is due to something else. So uh, here's the CO2 trajectory up till now. Here's what we project. So we're going to fit the data with what the actual CO2 concentration was since 1850. So we're dealing with this part of the data. This is part of our projection. All we've done with our equation is find out what is the value of this constant, TCS times 1 plus what is the value of this constant that makes the model fit the long-term data trend? We only had to find one constant, and that constant's defined by this data. Now, what climate scientists would want to do, they'd want to do some sophisticated fit of all of this noise in here to get the long-term trend. What's important is the change in temperature over the time. So I said, well, there's a sharper baseline here of the top of the data scatter in the HADCRUP4 data. And if, if I use that as a baseline and use a similar baseline up here, I've seen the same total change in temperature that's going to determine what this constant is. And originally, if, if you all remember with our spotted snakers, I was trying to envelope this point. And on my trip to Rome in April of 2015, I showed a curve like this, and one of the meteorologists said, oh, that is a well-known El Nino event that occurred back in 1877 and 1878. Said, so that's not greenhouse gases, that's a weather event. And it gave me the confidence, because I knew this 1998 wild point was the, was the 1998 El Nino. Since we've built this model, we've had 2015 and 2016 warm temperatures due to no super El Ninos. So I think what's going to happen as we get into 2000, I think the temperatures are going to fall back below this blue line. And that blue line is defined by replacing TCS times 1 plus beta with 1.8 degrees Kelvin. And that's all we had to do to fit this data is find out what constant here, uh, undetermined constant, but that actually fits the data. <clears throat> and this is a much, this is a tight fit. You've got to thread the needle between the upper reaches of the HADCRUT4 data scatter and these wild data points. And that's what that blue curve does. But it does measure the total temperature change in HADCRUT4 from the early beginning to what we've seen recently. See, this was the pause, and we were, we were bounding the data in the pause till we got to the big El Nino years, and you know, we're threading that needle. So we're saying it's never gonna get beyond this blue line because we know what TCS times one plus beta is. Now, beta could change going forward, all this, if we're going to forecast with this equation, we're going to say, hey, over the rest of this century, things are going to be like they were for the last 165 years. That's an assumption, but we understand what that assumption means. Anybody else that tries to project has got to make up some concentration of aerosol, CO2, all these other greenhouse gases, and they're guessing at it. They don't have any rational way to, so my simple rational way is, it's gonna keep on doing what it's been doing. And you can attack me for that, but I don't think anybody can offer anything better. And what I'm very confident about is over the next few years, we're gonna follow this, this path is gonna bound what happens to and I want to use this time where nothing bad's going to happen to get climate scientists to agree with us that all this uncertainty they're talking about uh, doesn't need to be considered. So this is the 
what I call the validation part of the model because we've taken a rigorously derived equation and we've determined the constant that makes the equation fit the actual data. Compare that to John Creasy's curve that he presented at the House of Representatives. That's what we're, we're taking this simple algebraic equation and we are kicking butt on those GCMs. I think we got a good story. And the EPA has this information now. Now, we can also forecast with our forecast of carbon dioxide. You know, we say it's gonna get up here, hit 600 parts per million, and we're gonna quit using it. And this is my guess is what's gonna, I think CO2 will start dropping after we stop burning fossil fuel. But it's just a little blip. Burning fossil fuels is a little blip in CO2, a little bit of warming. I think in a period of time after 2100 where natural forces are gonna to try to cool the earth. So this just says that we think what the maximum is gonna be. This green curve is the 1.8K we're, we're forecasting with, which is the same curve as this blue curve right here. The other important thing about this curve, we've been arguing with our state climatologists the last few days. This is 1.8K. What if I made this constant two? Well, back here where the change in CO2 is nil, you can't see the difference in these curves. They all give the same answer because the CO2 concentration is still about what it was in 1850 when you evaluate that logarithmic part. But now, at current times, we're really pumping a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. And we're going to be able to see, clearly see, the differences in temperature response depending on what constant we put in here. So all of a sudden, over the next few years, where we're going to keep putting CO2 up, the, the curve for 1.8 or 2 is going to start to deviate more. And if you use two and a half for this constant that a lot of climate scientists with their GCMs agree, it's clearly deviating from the actual data. Now, Nielsen Gammons beat me up because I hadn't put a statistically uncertainty on that. But I look at this data and say, hey, I don't have to worry about that. That's not what's happening. Why should I worry about that? That's some number that you don't even have a plot for. So that's the validation. That's using to project for out to 2150. And we see above current levels, we get about 1.2 degrees Kelvin max above the present. I don't think that's going to hurt us. Nothing drastic is going to happen. And the cool thing about this kind of global warming, because of the T to the 4 sensitivity of radiation, the tropics are not going to get hotter. The Arctic will get warmer, and you know that's a concern for maybe melting some ice and sea level rise. But when you worry about temperatures, uh, the tropics aren't going to get hotter. We're going to get a little bit warmer, but the way we're going to get warmer is our daytime temperatures will stay about the same. Our nighttime minimum temperatures are going to be a little bit higher. This is the way the the radiation works. But what is a little bit higher nighttime temperature, what kind of problem is that going to cause? If y'all remember John Christie's talk, he did an experiment out in California in some valley where he got exactly those kind of trends <coughs> with changes in greenhouse gases. So because of this radiation T to the fourth effect, in Houston, the difference in our max daytime temperature and minimum nighttime temperature is about 11 degrees Kelvin. And that's year round. It happens in the winter as well as the summer. So when we drop from max daytime temperatures down to the minimum temperature at night, we're not rejecting as much heat at night. And if the greenhouse gases are affecting that, our nighttime temperatures are going to have to come up a little bit to reject that heat. <clears throat> Pretty straightforward. The other point is we can, we can forecast with this model separately, TCS, if we're not going to be regulating CO2. But everybody publishing papers wants to know what is the value of TCS? Well, to know that, I've got to know what beta is. And when you look at the data to try to determine beta, which is the effect of all the other greenhouse gases and aerosols, 
it's a highly uncertain number, primarily because they don't know what aerosols are doing. And I'll, I'll show you where I got that data. So this chart I took out of the AR5 summary for policymakers, which means summary for politicians, basically. And sometimes they abbreviate that SPM. And so CO2, methane, all the greenhouse gases, they show the radiative force due to concentration and radiative force due to feedbacks. And so I'm just taking their data and trying to figure out what is beta and what is its uncertainty. And so the big frustrating thing about the AR5 report is they referenced everything back to 1750 for the greenhouse gases and they don't know what the temperatures were in 1750. We know with some accuracy what global surface temperatures were in 1850 and we'd like to know what the greenhouse gases were in 1850. So I had to take all of this data referenced to 1750 and project it forward to what these greenhouse gas radiative contributions were in 1850. And the way I did it is I knew how much CO2 increased from 1750 to 1850 because we got more accurate data. And I just assumed everything else was increased by the same percentage. I've been writing this up since June of 15 and I get sidetracked on other stuff. Did Jack Knight get here yet? I did all this for Jack to give this model presentation to the AIAA. I was going to send this out with some of my comments to Nielsen Gammon's green thought comments. I've got it all written up. I just never had it proofread to where it's So what I did, uh, these are the values I pulled from that previous table. And this is what the IPCC says. The radiating force in 2000, 2005. So this radiating force is increasing as CO2 goes up in the atmosphere. The methane is not increasing a lot. Nitrous oxide is the other big one, and it's coming up some too. And then they have these things called halocarbons, and there's aerosols. Notice the radiative forcing of aerosol is gigantic. This is how they've been playing footsie with the data. They've been adjusting aerosols in every year that they don't know to make the temperatures come out right. But this is where the big uncertainty and beta comes from. And this is what Lewis and Curry concluded when they looked at this data and tried to extract uh, TCR and ECS. But when they show this thing, they show the radiative forcing from the concentration, and then they postulate a bunch of feedbacks on cloud cover and other things. And I said, okay, I'm going to only look at the concentration contribution because the feedbacks we've captured in our definition of TCF. So I played, and, and this is from, I still need to answer Nielsen Gammon, when he wrote, said, I get betas like 0.2, and you're using 0.5. And the reason is, our model looks at concentrations of greenhouse gases, and TCS incorporates the feedback. So it's kind of how you keep books on this stuff. I have one more table here, and this is converting everything to radiative forcing relative to 1850, because that's what we need for our model. And I looked at the three sigma variations. I'm not putting anything in CO2. I think we know that accurately. But we got uncertainty in the radiative forcing of these other greenhouse gases. So when we look at the uncertainty in these other greenhouse gases, again, the big uncertainty comes from the concentration of aerosols. There's additional uncertainty due to what their feedbacks are, but I'm not going to worry about this because this is what I'm computing beta from. And so I computed beta several ways. I said, okay, beta, what if we say it's methane, nitrous oxide, hydrocarbons divided by the CO2 radiative forcing, you get betas 0.55. If you calculate it differently and said it's methane, nitrous oxide, halocarbons minus the aerosol contribution, you get 0.413. And if you look at what is the absolute minimum beta could be, what's the absolute max, you get all kind of values. What I did is compute 2010 mean value for beta. I got 0.413 and I RSS the three sigma uncertainties of each of the individuals. So this is where I was when I was writing the report. And I didn't like that answer because I wanted it to be 0.5 because that's what I'd been using as an estimate for beta. 
in previous presentations. So this is where my report lies. And then after June of 2015, when I had this written up, Bjorn Stevens, who's a warmest but a good scientist, came out and he looked at the cooling of aerosols that were in the AR5 report and he said, they can't be cooling that much. And he gave some sanity checks on why the AR5 report was estimating too much cooling for aerosols. At that time, Nick Lewis, who co-authored the paper with Judy Curry, that got very similar answers that we did by looking at this data, he said, well, we can adjust our TCR estimates downward that we published in Lewis and Curry because the cooling effect of aerosols we had in there is too big. So then his TCR value came down close to R1.2 for TCS. And at that point, I, I didn't work this problem anymore. I can. I just said, I'm going to round it beta. We're, we're saying it's uncertain anyway. If you use this number for beta that I got out of the data, we get a TCS of 1.27. But after this paper and after Lewis lowered their estimates that they had previously published here, I decided to just round beta to an uncertain value of beta equal 0.5. And when you do that, you get TCS equal 1.2K that we've been saying for several years. So I kind of cheated, but I had a good reason for it. And I didn't want to spend too much effort on all this flimsy data where nobody knows the truth. But I think they've been hyping the truth towards too much cooling from aerosols. And we got good papers to back that up. So that kind of takes care of the beta. I just wanted to show you, I converted our TCR to an ECS value to compare with these other things. Here's where we lie with a lot of other recent papers. And here's Lewis and Curry right here. All we did is said it's less than a certain number. So we're in the ballpark of what all these published papers are doing. This I've showed before, but if we take our uncertainty and TCR and convert that to ECS, this is our uncertainty band for ECS. To compute the social cost of carbon, the EPA assumed an uncertainty distribution like this, where they allowed ECS values as high as 10 degrees. The, the IPC report said, well, it's less than four and a half degrees. So this is what's been going on in our government to cook the books to get the social cost of carbon so high that they can justify the regulations. And I hope we have a chance to dismantle this in the next year. So our government is overreacting to the climate concern. The potential problems that they're worried about don't require premature critical decisions with potentially severe adverse consequences. EPA has already decided it must act to prevent a climate disaster. It bases its uncertain climate forecast on the unvalidated model predictions in the United Nations IPCC world. You saw what those model predictions look like against real data. They're, they're all high and they don't agree with each other. The EPA developed this complex, highly uncertain and scientifically indefensible social cost of carbon metric to justify benefits of CO2 emission regulation. And most of the benefits they compute is we're going to avoid sea level rise over the entire globe and we're going to avoid all this damage. And yeah, it's going to hurt to close all these coal-fired power plants and other actions. But the damage we're going to avoid from sea level rise is clearly offsets this pain that we got to go through. And they're forcing that on the American people. The, the people are going to get hurt by this are people that can't pay their electric bills now. And you know what's going to happen? The government's going to subsidize them to pay those high bills, which means middle America is going to foot the bill. Okay, this is kind of a catch-all for what I recommended to the Trump administration. Our nation needs an objective scientific review of the EPA's social cost of carbon calculations. And what I'm looking for is the kind of reviews that NASA went through after the Challenger and Columbia accidents, where you've got a broad panel of experts that aren't inside NASA. NASA calls those uh, sometimes non-advocacy reviews. <laughs> or you bring people in that are going to try to find holes in what you did. And we have prepared ourselves to be on that kind of review committee, because we're not climate scientists, but we can understand the shenanigans that they've been up to. And I want to ask the questions. I don't want to ask the questions through some lawyer. 
I want to get the guy to answer the question, and based on the answer, I want to ask the next question. And I want it to be public so they can be embarrassed. The IPCC climate models are not sufficiently accurate for use in critical public policy decision making. We can bound this warming using available data, and we showed all that. The current pause should continue for about 20 years. I made this chart before we had the super El Nino of 2014 and 15, but I do believe we'll come back down towards those pause temperatures in the next few years. I believe there's some contribution of greenhouse gases. I think we have bounded that contribution. I think we have shown, you know, the maximum you could squeeze out of the theory, and we've shown that it's not scary. The economic justification for the EPA and Department of Energy CO2 emissions control regulations is based on unvalidated models, which I think is a no-no. ECS is not an appropriate climate sensitivity metric for regulatory decisions. I thought Nielsen Gammon agreed with me on this months ago, and I got to go dig out his email where he said it. Recently, he said, well, I think TCR is better, but I, wanna, I don't want to totally give up on ECS. I wrote him one today and said, okay, how do you want to blend ECS and TCR in some predictive model? The cool thing is the regulations don't let you forecast more than 300 years in the future. And ECS that's based on thousands of years clearly is an appropriate, and it's got so much uncertainty. So I'm pushing for our TCS metric to be used as the forecasting metric. I think it's very unlikely that CO2 in the atmosphere will, will be rising after 2200, and that's just because I don't know where the fossil fuels are going to come from. We could do a better job of tracking how much our worldwide reserves increase every year, because they do increase a little bit. If we took that into account, I think we could get more than 600 part per million. But I think it's also converged to a fairly small number. Again, EPA's use of this metric for regulatory decisions for CO2 emissions needs independent objective scientific review. I've got some backup charts, and Jim, I knew you were going to ask me about, there's our spotted snake curve. So what the model that I talked about today and derived, it handles this part. And then the other terms that I had roped off on the right, their variations have to be what's causing this stuff. But notice before I was trying to bound these points, I need to redo the spotted snake curve so that we're not trying to bound those points. We'll get a little different answer. So I haven't given up on this. It's just that we don't need that to define this curve, which really talks about the true contribution of greenhouse gases to the warming. So I'm done. It's probably five o'clock.